So I am a pediatric surgeon. I, um, um, oh, come on. I do other pediatric surgery. I'm not just a uh, adolescent bariatric surgeon. I did, I'm actually not even fellowship trained in bariatric surgery, although there are some pediatric surgeons now who are beginning to do that. In fact, one of my partners at Children's is a bariatric train, trained surgeon and a pediatric trained surgeon, and I like to make the joke that he's far more qualified to do these surgeries than I am. But um, I sort of was self-taught at NYU for five years with some adult bariatric surgeons before coming to Children's. And they gave me the opportunity to start a program here and to co-direct the Obesity Institute, which is a much bigger issue and addresses prevention, treatment, research, advocacy, and education. But today I've been asked to talk about the surgical component since that's what I, uh, that's what I specialize in, I guess. Um, and this is for, uh, for the treatment of morbidly obese adolescents. So briefly, I'm gonna talk about the trends in childhood obesity, which probably everyone in this audience is well aware of. Uh, I'll talk about the rationale for surgical intervention, uh, a little bit about the different choices that are out there, and then we'll have, a, I think, a short question session to get you guys back on time. I will have a table at the reception, so if people want to um, discuss individual patients or talk about anything in a smaller uh, atmosphere than having the whole room hear what they have to say, I'd be happy to do that. So you've all seen the maps. This is 1991. This is the United States. I'm not going to give a geography lesson today, but this is Louisiana, Mississippi, West Virginia, and Michigan. And at that time, these were the four most obese adult states, uh, 15 to 20 percent. Um, fast forward 10 years later, and the map has drastically changed. Again, this is adults for now. Um, Mississippi still leading the way. Uh, only one state is in the 10 to 14 percent, and that's Colorado. Uh, the rest of America is uh, in that 15 to 20 percent range that was the leading edge of the obesity epidemic 10 years ago. Now most of, this, most of the country is greater than that, um, and except for Mississippi. This is 2008. This is the most recent CDC data. Again, there are no blue states. This is not red-blue as you're used to seeing, uh, especially in the D.C. area. I've gotten very much more conscious of red-blue, and I might have to change all these slides to make different colors so that it's not confused with the political map. But um, again, one state, Colorado, 20, 15 to 20 percent. The rest of the country is now, this, you know, the Sun Belt in the middle of America is 25 to 30 percent. Same sort of... Um, this is the same uh, miscreants, I guess. Uh, Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, uh, what is that, South Carolina? I don't know what that is. West Virginia, Oklahoma. Um, anyway, most of the country is now greater than 30%, so that's one in three obese uh, adults. So if this conference has maybe 150 people in it or so, think about that. That's 50. 50 of you would be uh, obese. So it's actually staggering when you think of it that way, to just think about a room. So, so basically this whole section. <laughs> okay? Just think about what that means. So what's happening in kids is actually directly parallel to what's happening in adults. You know, our, we, just, we just commissioned this RAND report uh, to see what was going on in, in the district. And in the district, we're a little bit ahead of the curve. We're at about 36%. Uh, uh, um, overweight or obese, but the rest of the country is about one in three overweight and obese kids. Um, and at least one group, this is from Cincinnati Children's, who um, is one of the uh, leaders in, in this field, they think that, uh, they estimate that at least a million kids uh, or adolescents have a BMI greater than 35. That's important when we talk about surgery, which we'll get into in a, in a minute. So BMI, I guess everyone is now familiar with. When I first started talking about this topic five years ago, uh, it was important that I defined BMI for everyone. And I uh, also used to talk about how the pediatric community would use these words like at risk for overweight and all these sort of warm and fuzzy type things instead of calling a spade a spade, which is that these kids are overweight and obese just like adults are overweight and obese. And it, I think part of the surgical uh, world was was sort of 
uh, impacted on the, um, or, or superimposed on the pediatric world because once we started doing surgery in these kids, we had to use the terms that the adults were using or else it just got too confusing. So as you guys likely know, the, the overweight group is 85th to 95th percentile BMI for age and gender, and then obese is, is greater than 95th percentile for age and gender. My population is 105th to 110th percentile for age and gender, and because I'm a surgeon, I can't actually figure out how you have greater than 100th percentile since there are only 100%. I don't really, I can't figure that whole thing out. But my patients are on the far, far end of this curve, uh, which you'll see shortly. So the adult classification you guys probably know about, and I don't know if that's projecting. That's not too bad. So um, basically, when we're talking about obese, uh, we're talking about BMI 30 to 35, and then morbidly obese is reserved for patients who are, uh, have a BMI greater than 40, uh, which we'll talk about in a second. Then there's a group called the super obese, which is BMI greater than 50, and then again, this is a surgical thing. We weren't clever enough to come up with any new adjectives or adverbs or anything, <laughs> so we just decided to call the most obese people super, super obese. <laughs> very, very, very limited uh, group of people I work with. Um, but actually, it's very interesting. Um, this BMI of 60 is an interesting group because this is sort of where the surgical risk really starts to climb. And um, when you start a new program, I've learned uh, coming from New York down here, um, people are most interested in sending you the biggest and worst patients because they don't know what to do with them anymore. So a preponderance of these super, obese, super, super obese patients have been uh, coming through my doors lately. Um, so why does anybody talk about this topic? Again, I don't need to tell this audience what goes with being obese. Um, the, the comorbidities are well described and uh, maybe 20 years ago pediatricians weren't used to these diseases, but I think all of you now are becoming quite, quite comfortable, or at least maybe not comfortable, but quite familiar with uh, these sort of uh, issues. Um, two of the points that I like to bring up that I think sort of drive it home for me uh, are the, the, the bottom two bullets. So the quality of life of these patients, while that's not a reason to do anything solely for quality of life issues, but they rate themselves similar to adolescent cancer patients undergoing chemotherapy. So the obese adolescent is among the most miserable uh, child out there. Uh, they're often homeschooled because of bullying or whatever else goes on in the, in the school districts that doesn't allow them to, to stay in school. Um, they're social outcasts. They can't participate in many of, the, of what you would consider the normal um, socializing activities. So they're, they're actually, on the flip side, the most grateful patients I've ever taken care of. Once we take care of them and they lose weight and they re-enter society, they become actually my biggest advocates. I have a cadre of adolescents who want to be on my website or be doing media things for me or, or, or um, you know, or somehow helping me out because they're just so thankful. I got an email today from a, a mom who's... They're from Massachusetts. They couldn't get an operation in the United States. They flew to Mexico to get the operation. They came back to the United States. No one in Massachusetts would, it was a lap band, which I'll talk about in a little bit. No one in Massachusetts would adjust their lap band. So they either had to fly back to Mexico every month to get it adjusted or find someone in the US who would help them. They found me while I was in New York and it was uh, economically more, advantage, more advantageous for them to drive to New York monthly than to fly to Mexico monthly. And you know this is two years now, and they're still e emailing me to tell me how how they're doing. And um, you know, so those are the kind of stories that that keep me interested in doing this. Um, and I think it's it's important to realize what this what the opportunity to even have the therapy means to some of these kids. So the reason we the the big reason we do this is there's an increased risk of dying. Plain and simple, you are morbidly obese. You are at risk for early death. And this is shown, and this is from the uh, NIH in 95, but this is sort of why BMI of 40 was picked back in the, in the 90s as the uh, consensus weight for adult bariatric surgery. It's because, as you see here, the slope of the curve starts to turn up and be um, geometric as opposed to arithmetic in its progression uh, at about 40 or so. 
So again, you guys probably know this, diet and behavior modification can help some, but the vast majority of, of obese adolescents go on to be obese adults and incur all the risks of obesity in adulthood. So surgery was decided upon as a viable option for adults in 1991 with an NIH consensus conference, gathered all the experts, uh, and they basically sat down and talked about it and decided this was a, a reasonable thing to do. It's 20 years later, and there is no update on that consensus conference, which I think is uh, somewhat remarkable. Um, the, at that time, and what's, again, sort of been shown throughout the last 20 years is that the maximum sustainable weight loss with diet and medication uh, and the programs is about 25 pounds, more or less. And that's when we say sustainable, we mean from year to year. Most of the many programs that are out there have reasonable six-month outcomes. By year, those outcomes start to, the, the improvements that are made sort of tend to go away. And by two and three years, the patients are back gaining weight again. And 95% of all dieters regain all their weight, if not more. And if you, talk, if you go into PubMed and just put in weight loss surgery, you get 10,000 plus uh, manuscripts that are out there, or I don't know, manuscripts hits on PubMed, um, because this is such a hot button issue. So these are the NIH guidelines for surgery for adults. It's a BMI of 40, as we talked about before, or a BMI of 35. Uh, with a comorbid illness. And um, the last bullet is sort of an insurance mandate, which is that there must be a, um, a supervised, a medically supervised weight loss program for six months or so prior to any surgical intervention. Um, I think that's going to be very interesting when, if and when the ban gets approved to age 14, because there are going to be a lot of kids who are looking for that six month weight loss program to get their surgery, and I'm not so sure there are enough programs out there that exist to get them through. So I think that's going to be quite a, uh, an interesting uh, development in the, in the not too distant future. Um, so I use these same criteria for kids. Some of you may remember 2004, some of my colleagues who were starting to do gastric bypass on kids put out a, an article in pediatrics that put the bar way higher than these, what you see here, um, that paper probably set back the field of surgery five to ten years because IRBs around the country use that as their uh, benchmark and the group of surgeons, um, and I was actually, I was tangentially part of it because I was actually only a fellow at the time and was in on the conference call, but couldn't, couldn't um, well, I was a fellow, so I would leave it at that. Um, <laughs> they just, they didn't really have any experience and then, but put together a position paper, published in pediatrics, and it became law, law of the land. So I, I caution anyone who's um, planning on doing that to uh, think about what they do. And almost immediately after that publication, one of the people who was part of the group actually published an editorial saying how the group got it all wrong. But it's taken actually until uh, just this year or so where it's almost universally accepted now to use the uh, adult criteria for kids. So that's why I say it set it back somewhere between five and seven years. So this is why they set the bar so high. They were doing the gastric bypass. And this operation is the most common bariatric procedure in the United States. And bariatric procedures as a whole are now number two. So lap coli is the number one operation performed in America. Number two is weight loss surgery. It's again, a, sort of a staggering, staggering thought. Um, and it's a good operation in the right patient population. It produces a significant excess weight loss. So excess weight loss is if you weigh 300 pounds and you should weigh 150, then your excess weight is 150. If you lose 75 of that 150, you've lost 50% of your excess weight. So the gastric bypass, if you think about ge a generic patient who might be 100 pounds overweight, you know, the gastric bypass, you lose 65 to 70% of that weight, so 70, 70 pounds or so although most of our patients are far more than 100 pounds overweight. The problem with this operation, and the reason that I actually don't offer it to adolescents, uh, although I guess there might be, an, I shouldn't say don't offer it, there might be a, a, a unique situation where I would offer it, but in general I do not offer it to adolescents, is it does have about a 0.5 to 1% mortality rate. And that has tried, <laughs> there have been multiple publications in the adult community trying to 
get that number to look lower. But if you, if you, um, if you look at the randomized studies or the meta-analyses, it always comes back to about the same 1%. Now, the good news is that in kids, in general, they do better from weight loss surgery than adults do, and it sort of makes sense. The less time you've been dyslipidemic or have had hypertension or whatever, your operative risk would be less. Um, so in kids, it's pro it is probably lower, closer to about 0.1%, but I do know of patients who have, been, have undergone gastric bypass who have died as a result of the procedure, or adolescents who have undergone gastric bypass who have died of the procedure. Knock on wood, not any of mine, but I do know that they're out there. Um, it has about a 10% complication rate, many of which are severe, but it has the lowest failure rate. So some insurance companies will only approve one weight loss operation in the, in the patient's lifespan under that insurance. So they also drive people to this operation because it has the lowest failure rate. If you only have one shot, you probably would take the, or you might take the highest risk but highest yield operation out there. So another thing worth advocating against if one were in the advocacy world. So this is the operation that um, I was studying at NYU uh, and have published on and I guess have sort of built my academic uh, or my clinical academic reputation on. And it's called a lap band. And it's a device, a silicone device with a balloon on the inside that connects to some tubing that you see over here and then it goes to a little metaport type device that is anchored on the abdominal wall. And this was approved in the United States for use in adults in 2001. And again, I'm on my soapbox, so I, I get to say these kind of things. It's 10 years later, and we still do not have an indication for patients less than 18. Uh, it's something that I'm actively involved in and uh, hopefully will be presenting to the FDA in, in the next six months or so but it, it just boggles my mind that it's taken 10 years for this device that has nothing to do with physiology whatsoever um, to be approved in, in, in teenagers, uh, although it's approved to age 18. And it's actually, the FDA did a huge, I hope there are no FDA people in here, the, the FDA did a huge disservice to the adolescent community because not only is, it only, uh, is the device only approved to age 18, but there's actually a black box warning on the packaging saying contraindicated in patients less than 18. So you can't even just do the typical pediatric thing, which is say, well, there's no in information on this drug in kids, so we'll just use it in kids because it's, you know, we, we don't know. Uh, this device actually has a contraindication on it. And I've asked several people at the FDA what that contraindication was meant to do or why it was put on the packaging, and no one admits to knowing the answer to that. So, um, what are some of the issues with it? It is, requires meticulous follow-up for patient success. So most adult surgeons aren't interested in seeing their patients every month, so they don't like this operation because they'd rather do a bypass and never see their patient again. I think it actually fits well with the pediatric surgeons because we're actually used to seeing our Hirschsprung's disease or our PSARPs or any of our other major operations fairly frequently, so it doesn't actually bother us to have to see our patients on a monthly basis to adjust this thing. One of the thing that attracted to me, attracted me to the device when I first was thinking about it in 2004 was that it basically has about a 50 to 100 time less mortality than the gastric bypass. And it just made sense to me if we're going to do something uh, in adolescence, which is going to be controversial, we, controversial, we ought to do the safest, the safest operation. Um, it, too, like the bypass, has about a 10% complication rate but the complications are vastly different in terms of the types of complications. You don't get the life-threatening complications that the bypass uh, engenders. You get uh, device-related complications. So like, you know, as you've all dealt with patients with metaports who get clogged or the tubing breaks or that kind of thing, those are sort of the complications we're talking about. However, it does have this 20% failure rate. The, the bypass failure rate is about 10, well, 15 to 20%, 10 to 20%, depending on which study. Uh, and actually all the bariatric surgical procedures have that same sort of failure rate and it's something I'm actively interested in um, um, investigating to, uh, from a research standpoint. Uh, in the band, it appears that African Americans don't do as well and that's separate from socioeconomic or other uh, factors. It, it, in a multivariate logistic regression, you, the African Americans will still fall out as a group that doesn't do as well with not only this 
bariatric surgery, but all the bariatric surgeries. And there's also an increased failure rate in those who don't come for follow-up. So it's not a panacea for every kid. This is a cartoon of what it looks like. Um, we use five laparoscopic ports, uh, camera and the belly button. They're not actually as tightly bunched as shown in this video, but it's really just to, to get the idea. Um, takes about an hour or so to do the operation. And what we do is we dissect a little window behind the stomach, I mean behind the, where the, the G junction where the stomach and the esophagus meet. We put the band there, we um, hook it up to the tubing and to the port. And then usually we use um, liquid kryptonite or there's some other fluorescent green liquid to inject the band. And what that does is it causes a little bit of uh, indentation on the G junction and leaves you with a port, I mean with a uh, pouch of about an ounce. So the band on the inside of this compresses the top of the stomach and limits food intake. Um, but if you ask a band patient what that feels like, it's actually quite interesting, and I've been begging my people, my, my collaborators at NYU to publish this data, but we, we did a three-factor eating questionnaire on all our band patients and found that they basically, that the band basically abolishes hunger, um, and that allows the patients to make better food choices because they're now not eating because they're hungry and stopping at the most convenient fast food place that's next to their school, but they're actually eating just because they know they're supposed to eat at different times, and they can actually search out proper foods, and they, they obviously eat smaller portions because of this, um, this uh, restriction here. Uh, my guess is that it works by stimulating the vagus, both anteriorly and posteriorly on the stomach, and probably directly up to the hypothalamus and, pro and producing a, a satiety center change. Um, I haven't been able to prove that because there isn't a great mouse model of this, but it has made me think to have discussions with the neurosurgeons about just you know, directly stimulating the satiety centers instead of operating on what I consider to be the wrong organ. I mean, this, this is not a stomach problem or an intestinal problem. This is a brain problem. So hopefully someday we'll be working in that direction. So this is an esophagram from a patient who has a band that's appropriately adjusted. Here's the band here. Here's the tubing. This is not a teenager. This is an adult, but same, same idea. And you sort of can see that the uh, contrast almost hangs up there a little bit before it goes through the band. I'll show it to you again. And that's basically what the idea is, is it's to, to make patients feel full, satiated, so that they're not um, uh, eating bad food choices and it limits their caloric intake in general. And you can see here, this is the, the stomach that's in the band, and this is sort of like the small, narrow passageway between the two. So just some data. Uh, this was published in the Journal of American College of Surgeons in November. Um, this was our experience at NYU. This was part of an FDA-approved investigational device exemption trial. Um, one arm, no control arm. You can see our patients were about 16. This is the mix of patients we saw at NYU, um, so we can't really generalize these results to uh, all comers, but this was our demographic for what it's worth. And most adult bariatric sur uh, surgical series have this female preponderance. And this is a busy slide, and I apologize for that, but the, the, the important part is to see over here. The patients were about 300 pounds when they had surgery, and one and two years later, they're about 225. So they lose about 75 pounds, which was about 45% of their excess weight. And that's what you can basically expect from a band uh, in an adult or a kid is about a 40 to 50% excess weight loss at a year. And it's slow weight loss. It's about a pound or two a week uh, throughout the year. And uh, it's, it's hard going. It's not easy. It's not the instant gratification of a bypass. So it, it is not to be um, embarked upon lightly. Um, we, you know, obviously there was waist and hip circumference, which... Um, has relation has importance when you're talking about comorbidities associated with obesity. So these are DEXA results from this cohort, and unfortunately we weren't able to get all 45 through the DEXA, um, mostly due to some of the fact due to the fact that some of them were too big to get their pre-op DEXAs. Um, but basically, the group this group weighed 314, and again they were about 
225 at the end of the year. Um, and what was important in my mind is that there's this fat mass loss, which obviously makes sense, but there's also this lean mass loss, which is seen in all bariatric surgeries and is somewhat concerning uh, that you're losing muscle. And um, so it took, it took some, some thinking about, and what I would say is that it's likely due to the fact that if you're thinking about your large muscle groups like your thighs, if you're taking away the weight that they're working out with every day, um, they're going to have some natural atrophy. And this is a, a, a uh, common theme across bariatric surgery. And if you, can, if you actually look at the absolute numbers, these patients are losing more fat than they are muscle, so they're actually restoring their, their normal body composition even though they are losing lean mass. But it is something that's worth, uh, that needs to be followed uh, in the future to make sure that there's no issue with, with this lean mass loss. And then this uh, last column is android fat versus gynecoid fat or apple versus pear. And this is just important in my mind because it, it sort of makes teleologic sense that you would lose the fat that's associated with um, comorbidities first before you lose the peripheral fat. And this just sort of um, demonstrated that fact. So that's the band in, in a quick nutshell. So because of its issues and the fact that it's a device and the fact that it doesn't work on all patients, um, there's a new kid on the block, which is called the sleeve gastrectomy, which is a technically simpler operation than the, bi the bypass. And what it entails is basically a removal of the greater curvature of the stomach. And we think that this works in two mechanisms. One is it limits food intake again. This is a, probably about a four ounce pouch or three ounce pouch, depending on how you make it. Uh, but two, this part of the stomach is where ghrelin and leptin and all the other uh, hormones that you keep seeing on, in USA Today or whatever. Um, everybody's always talking about the latest hormone, peptide YY. Um, most of them, many of them are made in the, in the um, fundus of the stomach. So we remove that. And again, these patients tell you after surgery that they don't have any hunger. Um, it was originally developed, it's actually been around for years, but it was originally developed as the first stage of a two-stage weight loss uh, attempt in the most obese patients. So patients whose BMI was like 80 or 90, what they would do is they would do a sleeve gastrectomy first, and then a year or two later when their BMI was lower, they would convert the sleeve gastrectomy either to a bypass or to uh, what was called a BPD or biliopancreatic diversion or duodenal switch, um, which are not, not actually none of those procedures are really done anymore. But what they found is that a lot of their patients wouldn't come back for the second part of the operation because they had lost so much weight with the first part that they didn't want to go through another riskier operation. So actually just recently, over the last year or so, the, the, the National Society for Bariatric Surgeons uh, has now embraced this as a standalone operation and they're actually consensus summits and, and position papers. So now actually Aetna and Cigna and um, I don't, can't remember if any of the other major insurance companies, but they're now actually in the adult world starting to reimburse for this, this procedure as a standalone procedure as opposed to giving you the, uh, it's an investigational procedure uh, ex um, excuse. So uh, what can you expect if you get a sleeve? You get 50 to 70% excess weight loss, so better than the band, probably not as good as the bypass. The mortality is much closer to band than it is to bypass, so that's a good thing. And the complications are actually, frankly, much less than both. So really attractive operation. Problem is we don't have good five or 10 year data uh, about it and there is a known phenomenon where patients can regrow their stomach. Basically, if you think about it, if you just eat enough, you stretch your stomach a little bit, stretch your stomach a little bit, stretch your stomach a little bit, and after a couple years, you've actually stretched your stomach out enough that you can uh, out eat this operation. Um, so I have one patient who's actually done that already in two years because she, although she wasn't a Prater Willie, she was a developmentally delayed child and uh, was really unclear whether she was a compulsive eater or what was going on. And, and you know, uh, the mother and I, with and, the, and the, the daughter for what she could understand, just decided that it was worth trying this because we knew if we didn't do anything, we knew where that was headed. Um, so she did great for a year and a half, and then now two years out, she's starting to gain weight again. 
Um, so it's not a perfect operation either. Um, this is that girl's operation. Um, so, whoops, don't want to hear that. So it's done with five ports like the band. It requires a two or three night stay in hospital compared to the band, which is a one night stay. Um, it does have the, the risk of uh, the staple line leaking. This is a device called the harmonic scalpel. I'm always impressed by the um, industry people who they know we're filming these things, so they put their name like right there, so you can't, <laughs> there's no way to avoid it. It's very, very impressive. I'm surprised there's not like sponsored by Joe's Deli. Um, so anyway, what we do is we, we sort of, this is all the, what's the greater momentum, and there's this, obviously this large amount of fat. This is a 15-year-old girl who weighed, uh, I think she weighed like 325 at the time of her operation. Um, and we actually put all these patients on a two-week liquid diet pre-surgical so that we can uh, shrink their liver. It's actually a, a very fascinating phenomenon, but they, people have done like MRI studies to look at the size of the liver both before and after this diet, and they actually do shrink their livers because the fat in the liver must be the first to go. Um, so this is the liver up here, and this is the spleen. I, I think this is why Mark wanted this right after lunch so you could see all the blood and guts. But uh, honestly, for, for, a, for a surgeon, this is not a very bloody or blood and guts type of presentation. I tried to keep it as, uh, as G-rated as possible. Um, but anyway, so we, we clean up this, uh, the whole greater coverage of the stomach, detach it from the spleen, and this is the uh, pylorus. And what we actually leave about five centimeters of uh, antrum so that we don't have problems with intrinsic factor and um, nutritional deficiencies. Um, at the time, sur I mean, after surgery is a complication. Um, so we go about five to six centimeters from the pylorus and it's all measured. Now you can actually see Ethicon endosurgery even, even better than just the harmonic scalpel. Um, and this is the pancreas back here, or sweetbreads, depending on. Um, <laughs> um, just, just keeping it light after lunch. Um, and so basically we, we have to take all the attachments from the stomach to the pancreas here. And then you'll see in a second, we take a stapler and fire it across the entire stomach and remove that portion of the stomach, um, which we'll show you in a second. And again, so what these patients do, so this is a stapler and this is a, um, a, a special buttress of the stapling device that decreases the incidence of leak and or uh, bleeding. Um, so in, this is my first case and my first firing of the stapler, so that's why I'm looking around. I'm all nervous. I'm like, I, should I really uh, fire it or should I just uh, call it a day and go home? But eventually I fire it, and that's that little metal piece moving forward. Um, and it divides the stomach, which you'll see in a second. There we go, and that's the buttress. And so now what we do is we put a bougie down so that we don't make it too tight. Um, and so there's, you know, in the surgical world, we talk about the size of bougie, this and that, blah, blah, blah. Not really, not really that interesting, but what you need to know is that we don't intend to, we, we need to make sure that we don't make it so tight that you can't swallow. You can imagine if we got too close to the G junction, we could cause a mechanical problem. So this is just a couple more fires of the stapler um, that um, goes up towards the G junction. Again, this is the liver being held out of the way with a, with a sort of a, a retraction device that gives us the room to see. And um, eventually, after a couple fires of this thing, we take this portion of the stomach out. And as you might imagine, it took, we've, we've done a couple of these cases at Children's. In fact, we haven't even done a band yet, even though that's what sort of I promised everybody I would do to stay safe. But I, uh, it, because of the FDA issues, it's been hard to... To, to, to do, um, and these kids do really well. And you know, my two patients from Children's have lost, so they were in January and February, I think the, the boy has lost over 100 pounds already and the girls lost like 60 some odd pounds. Um, so they do well up front. This is, a, this is the same bag that we use to take the gallbladder out. We just put the stomach in the bag and, and take it out one of the port sites. Um, and this is a test we do at the end of the operation. So we put about an ounce or two of saline with some blue dye in it, and we just look to make sure that we don't see it coming out of the um, staple line anywhere. And if it, if it were there, we would throw some stitches in there. 
Um, I threw some stitches, which I think you're going to see in a second, in this case anyway, because I was, it was my first one again, so I was sort of doing the belts and suspenders thing. But my, uh, the people who make this buttress device tell me that I do not need to do this. But again, I didn't want my first one to go awry, so I was like, ah, I'm just going to do it. So that's that. Um, so, as I said, we've done a couple of children's already. We have about a handful of, actually we have our first band coming up in July. We have another a couple, I think another band in August. We have a couple sleeves in uh, July. Um, and, and I imagine, I can tell you that, so last Monday in my clinic, I had seven new patients scheduled for surgery. Um, and I imagine, uh, we haven't even started to advertise yet because I'm a little bit concerned of what's gonna happen once the word gets out and whether our uh, hospital can handle the volume. Um, you know, I, the reason I did two cases in Feb January and February and haven't done any since is I wanted to stop and reassess the system and make sure, so first of all, it took me six months to get the hospital up to snuff to do this kind of operating in a children's hospital. As you might imagine, they didn't have the Hoyer lifts, the, the they had some of the stuff actually, I was surprised, but uh, you know, I was actually checking strain gauges on toilets. You can imagine how I felt about that as part of my, uh, my job, but you know, the people don't think about the fact that you have to have some place for these kids to, to um, pee. So you need special uh, com bedside commodes and special toilets and all that stuff. So anyway, it took us six months to do that. Finally did that, did the couple surgeries and I was like, well, let's reassess the system and see how, how it goes because I don't want to have a bunch of cases lined up and then have to cancel them. Turns out we did pretty well, so um, there weren't any actually major deficiencies and the hospital actually, not only the hospital, but the hospital staff really embraced the program, um, not initially, but uh, after some convincing, they, people really got on board. So I think that things are only gonna sort of explode from here. And eventually I'd like to do a randomized trial between bands and sleeves, because I really don't know which is the better operation for kids and um, I don't, I, I feel pretty strongly that the bypass is the wrong operation but I don't really know between these two which is the way to go. So hopefully, uh, as soon as the ban gets FDA approval, uh, I will submit my NIH grant to do this trial and, and hopefully help provide some answers in the future. So thank you everybody for the time and the attention and uh, I'd be happy to take, I guess, some questions now or do you wanna? Okay. So that is a great question. Um, so the youngest, uh, so actually, I, I have to tell the story of, of my first, actually she was my second patient at CNMC. Um, and unfortunately I had, I have her story on cards to give people that were supposed to go with this um, awareness bracelet that she designed for me. So it's getting back to the sort of grateful patient thing. But there was a little snafu and we, I didn't, we didn't make the bracelets in time. So. I don't have the bracelets, but I have the story. And so now you've given me the opportunity to tell the story. So she was 12 when she found me. She was a 80 pound four year old, a 300 pound 12 year old when her mom called me for, also from Massachusetts, different patient saying, you know, please help us. And at that time, this was 2008, I guess, 2007, uh, I was unwilling to operate on a 12 year old. So. Um, because the, the FDA trial was going on and the FDA trial was including down to age 14, so I kind of felt like the national accepted low end would be 14. So I told them no, but I would help them work through the issues. And between 12 and 14, she put on 140 pounds. So she was 440 by the time I got to operating on her. And so when I get this question now, I think to myself, I don't have a good answer because if I saw a 13-year-old who was a 12-year-old who was Tanner 5, Tanner 4, who had reached their peak height and met all the other criteria, I don't know that I would be doing the right thing by waiting to an arbitrary age like 14 just because that's the number that we all accept. So uh, I've been approached by an 11-year-old in Utah um, who's got uh, had a crano not a craniopharyngioma but like a craniopharyngioma resection, so I was hypothalamic obesity, uh, asking for an opinion. Um, you know, again, I think that 11 would be pushing it for me, but I think it's more of an individualized patient physiology and 
emotional development, because there's a whole, we didn't talk anything about the child psych side of this thing, but that's a huge component, and my child psychologist is a, is a, a comrade in arms with me, and we have to decide together that a patient's ready. Um, so if, but the, you know, I have a 13-year-old from Tennessee who's skipped two grades, so she's, in, she's a freshman in high school, and she's 350 pounds, and BMI is 50, but she's 13. If she met the criteria, she, she hasn't got done her six-month weight loss trial. But if she met, the criteria, met that hurdle, I'd probably operate on her. Because I think she's, I mean, I know what's going to happen if I wait till 14 or 15. She's going to put on more weight, and her surgical risk will be higher. So the answer is I don't know. Uh, I would say it's who stands with the next peer presentation. Okay. Um, oh, let me get rid of this. So, I mean, bariatric surgery in general is weight loss surgery. I mean, that's sort of how I would describe it. Um, I actually usually use that term as opposed to bariatric surgery. You know, there are more and more things coming down the pike. There's, there's uh, endoluminal sleeve, which is going to be a endoscopically placed uh, sort of like a condom that keeps the uh, food from being absorbed that won't be necessarily surgery but will be a weight loss intervention that may have some promise so I guess the point is that the, the definition is expanding 